In one thesis, they tested the serotonin levels of depressed mice in relation to drugs on the market and creating a type of structure based on biogeometry principles. And they found that the shapes that we use, the biosignatures used in the structure, actually raise serotonin levels better than two of the drugs. That's one example where we're saying we can see the effects of biogeometry. Back again with another Soul Seeker podcast. Doria Kareem, I am so stoked to have you on the Soul Seeker podcast to talk all things about biogeometry. I first heard about biogeometry from Kyle Kingsbury, one of the coaches of Fit for Service, and he's been using it in so many different ways personally with his family, but also at the ranch and the eco village that he's building with Aubrey Marcus and so much more. Doria, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me. I'm excited to be here. Same here. So let's just start from the beginning. You and I chat a little bit before we hit record. And I explained about like how some things in spirituality and just mindfulness, whatever you want to call it, can be very confusing. And I like to try and make it more accessible. So biogeometry, what is it? I'll start with the most important key point um, of biogeometry, which is basically When we talk about energy, what it is that we are trying to reproduce or recreate from a biogeometry perspective. Uh, And also just the word energy. I mean, for us, um, we, whenever we have classes, we spend time really just defining this word because a lot of times we just use it and we're not quite sure what we mean. And it's really quite simple. You know, we just say energy is the ability to produce an effect. And You know, when we talk about subtle energy, we talk about uh, types of energy that are not um, electromagnetic or not measurable with electronic devices. And so the birth of biogeometry is this was so biogeometry is actually founded by my father. He's an architect. And there's this whole history of um, how he inherited these texts of a school called French Redesthesia. And French Redesthesia is basically a school that um, will approach energy qualities or energy effects through a color scale. So those those listening who are familiar with the chakras, for example, um, they might hear that certain chakras are related to a specific color. And so it was, it's, or for example, when we talk about classification scales, a lot of people in Chinese medicine might be, uh, you know, they'll know things like yin yang or female male energy qualities. So those are ways of just classifying energy effects. To make the long story short, when my father inherited this, um, all of these French redesthesia works that talked about classifying energy into different color qualities and their effects, he, um, as an architect, was looking at uh, environments, creating how can we create subtle energy environments that are supportive and centering to anybody living there. So there was a key aspect to that because basically whenever we, if we talk about anything, even from a subtle energy perspective, if we're talking about creating something that is both beneficial for me and for you, for example, we might have completely different um, needs. Our subtle energy makeup um, might have different balances and imbalances. So how is it that we can create um, an environment that is beneficial to both of us? that promotes vitality for, um, for us both. And this is where he started looking at the energy of sacred power spots. And this is the key of being an architect as well. Um, and so he looked at the energy of sacred power spots. And so these were areas that were, since the dawn of humanity, known for their special, whether it's healing effects, oracles, but even these spots were identified by animals, Um, And all throughout the ages, there were different ways of identifying these spots, but all of these different ways were actually related to observation of animals, observation of health, observation of areas where you would have this strong life force energy. And that was the key to biogeometry is actually detecting this energy being, how can we detect and recreate this energy quality? So remember we said we use a color quality scale. And so it was detected through three specific uh, energy qualities. Now this becomes interesting because once you can detect it, you can basically learn to 
replicate it or enter into resonance with it. And that's the goal of biogeometry is how can we recreate it in our built environments? How can we recreate it in our bodies? And to make use of, of what we refer to now as the centering effect. So a lot of times also we hear this word centering. Mm -hmm. We use it in a very specific way in biogeometry because we're aware that in these power spots, we can have completely different imbalances and both experience, um, it both experience even if one of us is overactive or underactive in a specific organ function, both, ex both experience balance. So we say that it goes beyond polarity. And then this is where we find the term centering. And with, so when we can um, recreate this, this energy quality, the whole idea now is a lot of people talk about or use the term bridging science and spirituality. And so we have a very specific way of doing this in biogeometry. And we said that the way to do this is actually to use a spiritual energy quality practically. And that's how we can bridge science and spirituality. And so, I mean, we've talked about even before coming in, for example, uh, we both showed each other that we're both wearing yeah. this biogeometry necklace. Um, and while we do have um, specific products, the biogeometry's history is all about actually implementing this energy quality in all of these different fields and research and observing the effects. And so from that, we have, I mean, today in Egypt, it's um, it's wonderful because you have so many architecture and design students actually getting their master's and PhDs in biogeometry. Um, this happened because my father is a professor of architecture here. So it's easy for him to help guide students. But you can see all of these different effects coming out of these from, for example, um, in one thesis, uh, they tested the serotonin levels of depressed mice in relation to drugs on the market and, and creating um, a type of structure based on biogeometry principles. And they found that um, that the, the shapes that we use, the biosignatures used in the structure um, actually raise serotonin levels better than two of the drugs and just as well wow. as one. So that's one example where we're saying we can see the effects. Um, there was another one as well uh, with mice and Wi-Fi, where they studied the effects of as well different biogeometry structures and um, different. There's different levels that they would assess the mice uh, to assess anxiety, to assess to assess how much they would be exploring, um, how much they would actually um, urinate. Different all of these different levels showing the beneficial effects of biogeometry. So there's all of these ways now where we're able to see what happens to, and it's not just with, with animals, what happens to people's physical, mental, and emotional health when you bring this energy quality into their life. That's incredible. So just to break it down, to make it a little bit easier for everyone to understand, like, let's start with the pendant, the necklace that both you and I are wearing, um, especially for people listening, you can't see it. And on the podcast, you, you can't see it the way it's cropped and you really couldn't see it on a video unless you really put it up, but there's all these different markings on the pendant. What are these markings and what exactly are they doing to help increase serotonin, relieve uh, anxiety and et cetera? So um, when we talk about biogeometry, there's two different approaches. So there's specific design principles where we talk about shapes. Um, and then there's the pendant, which has to actually do with biosignatures. So biosignatures are really a special branch of biogeometry that have to do with energy flows inside the body's organs. And so those, for, for example, those familiar with something like um, meridian lines, mm -hmm. uh, they're energy lines that run across the body. And if we look at, for example, from a biogeometry perspective, the shape of the body itself is not haphazard. Okay, so there's a reason we have this shape. There's an archetypal template upon which this, upon which the human body shape is based. And even shaping the body we see has a huge effect on 
um, on the energy structure or on balance or imbalance. For example, those who practice yoga or Tai Chi might be aware of this, just entering to different body positions, having a different effect. Um, but we go further and we see that even if you just take something like a, a mannequin, a human shape, and you put it into different positions, you can start measuring different energy effects on anyone who looks at this mannequin who's in a wow. different position. So when we understand the power of shape now, when we look at meridians, for example, taking into account the shape of the whole human body, um, we look at biosignatures, which then look at every organ having its own shape. And any shape has, and this is where this is why these principles can easily be applied to architecture and design. Any shape, once drawn, you can begin to study its energy effects. Hmm. So when we look at the organs as shapes, we can begin to actually study the energy lines running through every organ. And so um, in the classes where we actually start to teach students how to test with what we call a color qualitative scale, where you have a pendulum calibrated to every color, they can you can trace in the organs different energy patterns all resonating with a different um, color quality. Hmm. And so once you have these, the idea now is resonance of shape between two things. So just like you have two similar tuning forks, if I hit one, the other one will resonate and vibrate. It's the exact same thing. If I put a pattern outside of my body and the same pattern exists within me, there, then you get a type of shape resonance. And that's what the biosignatures are. They are the patterns that exist inside the body. And when we bring them into the energy field, our body begins to resonate with them. And wherever there's imbalances, these corrective patterns begin to uh, create balance through each pattern having that centering energy quality that we mentioned in the beginning. And this, the biosignatures pendant was actually born from a hepatitis C research project in Egypt, where basically they, um, at Azhar University here in Egypt, the medical department was conducting a comparative study of all of the available um, solutions for hepatitis C, whether um, the whether we're dealing with medicine or whether we're dealing with alternative medicine. And so Biogeometry was invited to be a part of the study. And we they were given um, a pendant. It didn't look like this. It was called a chip at the time because uh, it was like a little bit squared and had all these squiggly lines, just like uh, we see on ours. And um, in stage one of the study, there was about 300 patients and 90% had a normalizing of liver enzymes. And so that actually prompted the Dean of the medical department to go out on national television and say, so we have these results, they're pre preliminary, but we have a science and this needs to be studied. And that announcement, even though usually you wouldn't announce in the middle of the study, the results actually prompted uh, us getting hundreds of people at the office asking for these pendants, which we didn't have. They weren't a product. They were part of the research. But that was the birth of the biosignatures pendant. And uh, thank you for sharing that. And how long ago was that? Oh, my gosh. Like, well, like 30, uh, are we talking like 30 years ago? Like it was a while, right? It was a while ago. Um, I mean, the YouTube videos on uh, the videos on our YouTube, I'm going to say it was in the 90s. Um, yeah. So about was, 30 years, something like that. It was, it was a little bit before I started working with my father. Amazing. And I did want to ask you, cause at the top of the pod, you mentioned that your father inherited uh, biogeometry. Could you speak to that a little bit more? What you mean by inherited? So not inherited by geometry, but basically the story goes, um, and I say it goes cause it's written actually in his, in his first book. He, um, it's called Back to the Future for Mankind, the first book. So he was actually uh, commissioned to work on um, the one of the museums that they were developing here, something to do with ancient Egyptian medicine. And he was asked specifically to work on it. At that time, he had a full practice with my grandfather and wasn't sure if he could take on the work. Um, but then it, it they specifically wanted him 
And they showed him these instruments of redesthesia, these pendulum instruments. And they told him um, that there's a science behind this. And he wasn't, he wasn't into, he didn't know the school of physical redesthesia at that time, but having been in Europe for years, he'd heard a little bit about pendulums in the sense of dowsing and asking questions to the subconscious. This is a little bit different from uh, the approach of these instruments, some of which were from, well, that t- at that time he was working on ancient Egyptian museum, which are basically that every shape or every pendulum being used or scepter had an effect based on shape energy. Again, if we're talking about ancient Egypt, the most common um, shape with an effect that people are aware of are pyramids. Um, mm-hmm. But then, of course, you have lots of other shapes that people are aware of, like the key of life and Jed and the wedge and so on. And so he was told, uh, you know, when you go to France, um, go and ask for these books about the school of French, or sometimes we call it physical redesthesia. He said, okay, he wasn't planning on going. Um, then he ended up having to go to France, <laughs> uh, stayed there for a few days. Finally, before leaving, went to this uh, store, um, the Maison de Redesthesie there, and he asked for these books, was told, oh, we don't have these anymore. And then there was a woman who overheard him asking. She said, are you the Egyptian? And he said, yes. Um, she said, we've been waiting for you for a few days. Why didn't you come? Just follow me. And he, and then gave him this huge stack of books and research of French redesthesia and told him that she knew that it was an Egyptian who would revive this work. Mm-hmm. And that's when that whole idea of when he looked at this work, there was a whole body again of, of how to approach subtle energy, how to find imbalances, how to correct them. But he also knew that not being his background as an architect and not as a physician, he is what basically pushed him to focus on sacred power spots, the built environment, the importance of shape, energy quality, and how we can reproduce this and make use of it in our environment. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing that. And what's coming up for me is the term grid work. Would this fall under that category? And for someone hearing grid work for the first time or what your father does, like kind of being in with the land with sacred power spots, like, you know, words like uh, vortexes or portals, things like that. Could you speak to any of this at all? Yes. I mean, when we talk about a power spot in general, and we talk about finding that centering energy quality, what you actually find Some people might be familiar with the term ley lines, Mm -hmm. Um, but when we go specifically to a power spot, what you usually find is uh, underground water streams that are crossing at specific angles. And then from these, we get that um, centering energy quality. And normally, if you go to a sacred power spot, you can actually see as well in the book, Back to a Future for Mankind, a mapping, for example, of the Giza Plateau. And you see all of these centering these BG3 lines, and you see that where they cross is where the pyramid is placed on top in order to radiate that energy quality. And so um, you have these positive lines. And of course, when we talk about um, grids, you have positive beneficial lines. You also have negative lines that we also have to address from a bi-geometry perspective. And, um, And so you also have, for example, from the German system, the ones that we work with the most are called Hartman and Curry lines that need to be um, addressed in the home environment. And so when we, but this concept of understanding the vortex, um, we can actually just look at this by studying the energy of any shape, but specifically a circle. When we take a circle, we actually detect that centering quality right in the middle of the circle. But um, it's always funny because there is no center of a circle. If you draw a circle and say, this is the center, the center can always be expanded. So there's always the center of the center. So we actually find that this BG3 energy quality is related to, um, or has, um, this multidimensional energy effect. And so you can see that vortex, or you can see that window by understanding, um, the center of the circle, or for example, when we talk about numbers, things like the recreation of ir- irrational numbers as in, um, will have that effect. So same thing we can see through that 
this concept of the window and this concept of multidimensionality. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's a lot I take in, right? Absolutely. Very cool. So let's unpack pyramids because you grew up in Egypt where, where that's right. Yeah. And yeah. your, your father's from where? Egypt as well. So oh, he is. Okay. I, I heard you say something about leave. Uh, okay. Got it. Yeah. That yeah. We, 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 so we, we both, I mean, obviously at different times we grew up here, he yeah. moved to Switzerland um at a young age and so he went to a uh, university there he studied at Eteha. um i left to i just moved back from bc from canada okay um, but i did i did grow up here yeah so you've definitely been tra you've traveled the world and been in, in other areas and everything else i've never been to egypt it's all on my list it's one of the top places i want to go for sure and i'm very fascinated by the pyramids uh human origin stories things like that when you talk about ley lines or just the sacred power spots and how they align with the pyramids and when we look at so I mean, I've never seen them in person, but I am of the belief that humans didn't weren't able to create the pyramid. So I'm curious from your point of view, having grown up there and being in this type of work, what comes up for you when we start to talk about the creation of the pyramids? Um, so you, so one of the big things that we talk about um, when it comes to, because we get a lot of um, people visiting Egypt and then um wanting to understand how by geometry sometimes people were referred to by geometry as being revived from ancient egypt and we always have to clarify there's something um we can basically we are not able to approach the world and this is what we have to keep in mind when we look at ancient man we have to understand ancient man as a completely different species and that's the approach that we actually have to take whenever we approach these sacred sites in Egypt in order to um, in order to begin to try to understand what they were trying to do. Um, in the sense that when we talk about a shift from right brain perception to left brain perception, we understand that ancient man had within his fingertips access to the laws of nature. You know, one of the words um, we like to say is, that the ancient man was spokesman of the earth. And you do hear stories that um, in terms of the pyramids and lifting the stones, that there were uh, that there were possible incantations and things that they would say that would allow this energy quality, um, that would allow them to lift and place the stones in place. Um, but the big approach that we have to say is when we understand ancient man as a different species, that's when we can start actually having a conversation as to what they were trying to do. Because what we're always trying to do is impose our idea of their goals. And this is where sometimes, for example, you find people saying, oh, they were trying to use the pyramids to recreate, to create electricity. Um, because that's the form of energy that we are caught up with. Right. Where when we come in and we look at ancient man being completely in tune with nature through through their right brain perception, we understand that their goals would have been very different than our goals today. Now, looking at the pyramids specifically, um, we when we understand their pyramid shape and the dome shape, when we study their energy effects, these are both shapes that we call energy emitters. And so they are when you place them on the power spot, they radiate that energy quality all throughout the area. And so we actually see this being carried through. You see this first, the origin would actually first be dolmens placed on power spots. Then we move into, sorry, um, you have megaliths, you, and then you have obelisks, and then dolmens covered by sacred um by, covered by mounds that we a lot of times we refer to as sacred hills and then you get the pyramid um which is also a, a dolmen uh, the king's chamber inside covered and it radiates that energy effect throughout the area and you actually see the, the same thing in sacred architecture with domes um in churches and mosques you actually see them placed on power spots but there is a very important thing there because when we talk about pyramids, 
we always have to give um, a little bit of a warning because the pyramids have been used now a lot for people will use them for meditation or create crystals and things around the house in the shape of this. And there's a few things to keep in mind there. One is when we say these shapes are energy emitters, you have to think about what it is that you're emitting. You can't just take these shapes and place them in your environment full of Wi-Fi, full of geopathic stress, and just place it and assume, okay, this is uh, this is going to be radiating beneficial energy. They were placed, it's like they were plugged in to the Giza Plateau and other areas. Now, the other thing is the pyramid. A lot of people who study this shape are aware that it has a dehydrating effect because they'll use it for food conservation. But then they meditate below it. So you can't, if something has a dehydrating effect, it's not something that you want to be spending time below. Hmm. Now, this is different from the Giza pyramids, which most people aren't aware of, but they're actually eight sided pyramids. There's a little indentation at the center of each of the pyramid, creating what we would call this rotational aspect that actually helps to cancel this effect that would be draining on our energy system and on top of it being based, uh, placed on a power spot. And this is where we can see that centering quality now being amplified through the corrected shape and the correct placement on the power spot. Wow. Yeah, that's it's a, a very important distinctions that you bring up. And what stood out for me was in Western culture, you know, crystals, right? Because most of us will buy crystals, whether it's in a form of a pyramid or different shape, and we'll look at the properties and benefits and we'll put it in our house. And there are a more advanced crystal workers, people that have crystals in their house kind of understand it and are able to place them in the right areas of their home. But for most people, if you buy some crystals, you just put them in your house, what feels good to you. What would you recommend for kind of like the everyday person, Western culture that's buying crystals and how to line them in a way that's being um, intentional? So they're not just like, putting them in a way that's going to uh, drain their energy or anything else? I mean, um, one, uh, I, one resource I can recommend is, so one of our licensed instructors, Dr. Robert Gilbert, he is director of the Vesica Institute, and they um, have a host of classes that they give, including by geometry classes and crystals. Cool. Um, and they will test for the specific bands that I just mentioned. So that that dehydrating quality, it actually um, is connected to an energy that we call vertical negative green. But they will actually check the, the, the crystals that they sell. I know that they will check for different energy qualities. Um, I also know that they will, they will find um, that their guidance of how to use the, the crystals would definitely be with the backing of this knowledge. And they would be a much better resource than, than what I could recommend in terms of, uh, in terms of crystal work. Well, yeah, thank you for that, because I think it's important because yes, if one were to go to Egypt and sit in the pyramids and meditate, not really have much of a spiritual practice or not really know what they're getting into, um, different things might happen that could be overwhelming, right? I've heard some stories and I'm sure you have seen some wild things, which actually I'd love to hear from you. Is there anything that you've experienced firsthand or maybe have seen in terms of uh, multi-dimensional uh, unexpected things happening from meditating or being near the pyramids? Um, I mean, just living in Egypt, you, you hear... Um so many different stories. Um, now in, in the book, uh, it is explained how the pyramids have an effect on time waves. And so this is associated with um, why some people will get different types of hallucinations. Um, but one thing I will suggest for anybody going to meditate in the pyramids or different um, things like that and other sacred sites, the pyramids are if you're going and trying to meditate in the king's chamber, try to visualize it closed. 
try to visualize the pyramid with what we know about it. For example, the gold encasing that you're supposed to have on top. Just by um, the first time that I went to the pyramids and we were measuring the energy inside, um, you could see that it was really, that BG3 energy quality was strong, but of course I assumed it was going to be off the charts. Um, and then it was only when my father said, give me a second. And then he, and then I suddenly found that energy quality um, just raising up so high. And I was like, what did you do? He said, well, I just imagined that chamber closed because we come in and we make changes to these sacred sites without being aware of how we are affecting them by moving them, for example, um, by taking something. It's as if you, a lot of times moving the obelisks, right? So there's obelisks from Egypt all over the world. So you're taking these out and placing them in different locations and they were meant for these specific locations. Yeah. Uh, okay. So that makes a lot of sense. And I, I think that's a good idea. Any more resources for people that are listening to this and do have a Egypt trip coming up or anything else to go? Uh, deeper? I mean, uh, I'll say that uh, one of the things that we always just mention is uh, just remember when you go to these sacred sites to go to them with um I guess just remember the sacredness of the site. A lot of times we people forget about that. Um, and then there's a lot, I mean, for people uh, interested in, for example, the Lutzer Temple, a great resource resources, Schwaller de Lubitsch's work, where he talks about the archetypal proportions of man and how that temple was built um, in accordance to those proportions. Uh, and then, I mean, if you are coming to Egypt, there's... Uh, there's different approaches that people will take in, in guiding you. So there's a lot of times it's good to have, to, to look up the background of the tour guide. Um, and if you do that, if you understand, so a lot of, it's not every tour isn't created equal in that. Um, I mean, I know because we have a lot of students who will take other people to the sites and uh, they will have look they will look at esoteric ancient Egypt. And they will look at how you can activate different aspects um, of these sites or of what we call, uh, when we look at the gods and goddesses of ancient Egypt, we refer to them as netters um, or nature powers and the healing power of these nature pow uh, powers, how we can enter into resonance with them, how these sites were created in order to recreate their energy quality and connect us with them. And so I think just having... Um, having somebody who has that background guiding you is, is always very useful. Yeah, definitely. And for me personally, I mentioned that that's uh, been in top of my list to visit Egypt, but at the same time I've had opportunities to go and I look at it kind of similar to like ayahuasca or something like that. Like I want everything to just flow and really just be, feel called and just be in alignment. And it's not something that, um, I take lightly as well. So personally, yeah, I'm not the type that would just like be like, oh, I'm going to book a flight to Egypt and, and uh, look online for a guided tour or whatever. You know, I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm definitely waiting for my time, but thank you for speaking of, about the pyramids in Egypt and all that. That's always a fun little rabbit hole to go to kind of start to wrap this up in terms of biogeometry. What are, uh, just the most, like, what is the biggest goal for you guys? Like, is it so that more people can feel better and increase their mental health? Is it to go back uh, to the different, um, like more feminine type consciousness and, and help the earth and things like that? Like what, what is your aim? I mean, I think overall, we, we mentioned a little bit, the shift from right brain to left brain perception. And I think overall what we've, um, what we can say, and that right brain perception is related to the feminine. Um, we can say that, I mean, right now there is a shift going into where we went from right brain swung into left brain. And slowly now we're trying to connect to the right brain, not to say there isn't a role for the male energy there as well. There's a role for the male energy to transform itself into a supportive energy quality versus an oppressive energy quality. Um, in terms of supporting that right brain um, 
that right brain information and wisdom coming into our daily life. And I think just by being aware of the multidimensional nature of the human being, which more people are opening themselves up to, um, we can start looking at solutions that support us, not only on the physical level, but support us on all the levels, physical, vital, emotional, mental. And I think I think biogeometry is a part of this role because we're getting architecture students whose designs are being tested um, to help with, you know, centers for ADD and ADHD, to help mm. with um, children with autism. Now we're working on specific classroom designs uh, to help with anxiety and depression, like you mentioned. And one of the things we found, um, probably the the most known application that biogeometry is known for was in Switzerland, where there was a cell tower installed and lots of problems coming in um, with animals and with people. And then we went in with a biogeometry solution. So of course I'm paraphrasing like a, a big yeah. thing now. Um, but the big thing there to address was uh, people were first complaining about physical ailments, but then when we went for the solution, a lot of people said, it's not just physical, our mental health is affected. And we understand that even, even if you address the physical aspect, we want the tower gone unless you can also address the mental emotional aspect, things like tension, things like not being motivated. And it was interesting to consider that as a pilot project for what a community could look like when we look at the human being in their full um, nature, because we saw, you can see this graph where it's people complaining about symptoms, physical and mental. And you see where it, it's tipped, where the most common thing is to say, I have symptoms. Okay, it doesn't matter what they are. I have physical symptoms, I have mental symptoms. And then you see after the biogeometry solution that the most common thing for people to say was, I don't have symptoms. I don't have physical symptoms. I don't have mental health symptoms, which um, just looking around, you don't feel like many communities can say that. Not many people, mm -hmm. if, you know, and this is, I haven't done a survey, but if I were to guess, if we were to take 20 random people and say, do you have any physical, your sleep, tension, anxiety, um, headaches, any back aches. This was all part of the study. Most people would have one or two things to complain about. And so we were able to, with a biogeometry solution, say, okay, we can move it from this to this. Might not solve everything, but it showed that the human state, that the normal human state can actually be one that is thriving. And so, you know how they would say in ancient Egypt that you had three types of doctors. The first one was the one to not get you sick. I don't know that the second one, I don't remember, but the third one was if you actually got sick and it was basically after the first and the second one failed. Mm. Um, and so it's really going back to that type of approach where um, I'm not saying we're not, we're not saying the medical system shouldn't be there. And we're not saying, of course, we're saying that the alternative system should also be there to help support the medical system. But we're saying that there should be a focus on the environment being a form of preventative medicine through the centering quality that we have access to. I hear you. And it resonates deeply with me. I'm not someone who's a, a student of, of the like kind of more mechanics of health and things like that, but it's something that is very important to me. And, you know, recently, I believe it was Boston college who uh, released a study that nearly half of the population, at least in the U S is experiencing either anxiety or depression, nearly half since the pandemic. And we know this worldwide, like we just inherently can feel it. You know, online research has gone up to support one's mental health 500% since the pandemic, since the pandemic. So definitely this uh, is something that we all need. It's not a question, right? And to find ways to improve our mental well-being. You mentioned how biogeometry helps with autism and anxiety, depression, ADD, ADHD. For anyone listening that would want to take the next steps, what would be a good product of your guys is to start with. I, I personally just have the pendant and uh, um, I'd be curious to hear as well, whether it's a pendant or anything else, what to know about that product. Because I remember, I think I saw a video from you guys, or maybe I read it on the website, but it was like, you put the pendant 
back on the charging case and don't let other people touch the pendant. So I'd be curious to hear straight from you uh, anything. That's okay if somebody touches your pendant. I mean, the whole idea is whenever you wear anything, it's not just the biometry pendant. Mm -hmm. Whenever you're wearing something on a constant basis, there's a lot of what we call um, your energy will impregnate on it. Mm. It will be in resonance with you. And so since the sole purpose of the pendant is actually to balance your energy quality and it has specific shapes to enter into resonance with the organs, um, we want to, once it's connected to you, since the whole purpose is that balancing effect with your energy system, then we want to keep it with you. But if somebody touches your pendant, it's fine. Um, but in, in terms of uh, this idea of the, the products to wear, I mean, we really have an approach where we say that what we're trying to maintain is an energy exchange balance, uh, a, a, a balanced or centered energy exchange balance with the environment. And so the pendant plus what we call the L90, we recommend wearing with the pendant just because the, the L90 is a shape that, so you mentioned that your pendant needs clearing and that's true. So it comes with a base. We need to clear it every day. Um, the L90 is a shape that we, that you can wear with the pendant that doesn't need clearing. Mm. This is, nice because a lot of times your pendant will if you want if we want to say will get overwhelmed or will impregnate in environments that are um highly detrimental and so that's why we say combine it with a shape that doesn't need clearing that's the l90 and then we have a home kit for the home environment and that's probably what i would recommend just the combination of both but i will say i mean one of the things we we didn't maybe talk about, cause we talked about meditation and then we talked about even things you mentioned like ayahuasca. And one of the things that I think is important as well as supporting people who are looking for spiritual experiences um, in having them opening up their energy system only within centered environments. So what I mean mm. is a lot of times we do a lot of rituals that were actually associated with power spots, but we do them outside of the power spot. And so the centering energy quality that we're talking about does have a type of protective effect. The L90, which I mentioned, has this type of protective effect. And so we see this a lot. For example, um, when we're going to teach in classes, there's a lot of places that we go to that are that a lot of energy work happens there. Um, and so because of that, there's a lot of actually energy clearing of the space that needs to happen. Mm -hmm. um, but people don't do that. And so we go, you go in and it's a class after a class of things like releasing energy. And so we actually spend, you know, the first 15 minutes just trying to actually clear the space before we have a class coming in. And how do you clear the space? I mean, the cube will, will do that for you. Um, mm -hmm. That's why that's one thing I was, I was mentioning, but there's a lot of different techniques you can do. There's uh, different visualization techniques that you can do. There's different, um, even, you know, one of the easiest ways to keep a space clear. Mm -hmm. um, we talk about the importance from a biometry perspective of thresholds of time and space. And so even things like people who do rituals and equinoxes, for example, that's an example of a threshold of time. Um, now there's also threshold of space, which is actually the entrance to space. So whenever we're balancing a site or balancing a home, we, we spend a lot of time looking at what we call the energy key of of how you enter the home or enter the set. And so if you just get used to um, whenever you're entering a location, especially your home, enter with your right foot and say a blessing mm -hmm. or visualize whatever you want, whatever. It doesn't have to be um, related to a specific belief. For some people, it's just a visualization of a uh, white light, but do it while you enter the space. And the the fact that it's coupled with entering with the right foot, which ha which creates an energy emission from the body, and the space uh, and the door, which has which deals with that threshold of space, um, that on its own will actually help to keep a space clear. That's pretty practical. Thank you so much. Because a lot of times there is a, a so there's so many different things, right? Smudge, biogeometry products, this, that, whatever, but. Uh, very practical to just get in the habit of saying a little prayer, entering with your right foot and, and just gaining that habit. So thank you for providing that. Thank you for taking the time to be on this podcast. 
It's so cool. Yeah, it's awesome. And I uh, would definitely like to unpack more with you as I learn more about this and hear from the audience what questions they may have. And it's it's so great. Thank you so much, Doria, for the work you, your father, your whole family, and everyone involved. Yeah, I appreciate it. And for the listeners, the best uh, place to connect with you, I'll put your website for biogeometry.ca in the website so you guys can just click it. Um, your Instagram as well, so people can send you DMs if they have direct questions. Anything else? Uh, I mean, we try to, uh, on YouTube, we have a playlist of uh, English videos, for example. I know that we're going to be adding, for example, any podcast that we do, such as this one on there, but it gives a lot of different, there's different resources. There's even two days of the class that my father was originally giving. It's an old recording, so don't expect the highest quality video and audio, but it's a great resource because it's like eight hours of, of biogeometry for those that want to dive deeper. I love it. Thank you so much. So guys, the YouTube channel for biogeometry is going to be in the show notes. So you can just click it from there. Awesome. Thank you so much, Doria. And we'll talk again soon. Mm -hmm.